Tower of Hope, which raised £9 million now in Granada. Roy Castle was its inspiration, and Network First now pays tribute. which every 30 seconds kills someone somewhere in the world. We know what its main cause is, and so in theory how it could be stopped. But that proved easier said than done. For 50 years we've waited for the disease to go away, but it hasn't. And we have no better way of curing it now than half a century ago. The disease is lung cancer. In 1994, it claimed the life of one of our most talented entertainers, Roy Castle. The news shocked us all, because for a disease usually caused by smoking, Roy was innocent, the victim, it seems, of passive smoking. One of the reasons that I developed this cancerous growth in my lung is because whilst playing the trumpet in smoky rooms, I inhaled great gulps of air, and none of it's filtered. Whatever its cause, Roy faced the grim reality of lung cancer that little could be done to save him. This shouldn't happen to you. He said it should not happen to people like you, but it has. Though racked with pain, Roy dedicated the last days of his life to a tour of the country, raising funds for a lung cancer research charity named after him, and offering hope that one day the disease may be beaten. Nothing in this for Roy. Roy. Roy knows that. It's for other people. Roy says it's for our children, our children's children. And he's given himself, he's, he's given his name to this appeal, he's given his commitment. And, and I think it's not unreasonable to say he's, give, he's giving his life for this campaign. And Roy, you're fantastic. If I was Roy, and if it had happened to me, you'd shut yourself away with your family and think, right, that's it. I'm not interested in furthering this for anybody else. You know, I'm, I know I, I now have an end to my life and I can see it coming and here are my family, I'm going to shut the doors I'm going to spend the last few weeks or months of my life with them. There are so many people behind it, so many people doing such a lot. How, how should I say, oh, I can't do it, I'm not well enough, you know. There must be many people who are suffering like I am and they're also doing their bit and so who am I? By going public on his lung cancer, he normalised what up to then had been a taboo sort of disease. And a lot of people were very, very grateful for that because some people wrote to him and said they'd really felt unclean and hadn't liked to talk about it, but he'd made it very normal. Cardiothoracic Centre at Broad Green in Liverpool and chest surgeon Ray Donnelly, founder of Roy Castle's Cause for Hope charity, heads for his weekly clinic where he gives patients the news they've been dreading. I've been a consultant here for just over 20 years and every week in my clinics I see new patients coming through the doors with lung cancer. So the scan done? Yesterday. And still the only realistic hope for cure is surgery. I don't, I don't think there's much doubt that it's a lung cancer. Really, I don't think there's any doubt about it at all. We have to decide what to do about it. The options are either we operate or we... Lung cancer is the most horrendous problem. Um, it's the most common form of cancer in the world. Something like one million people
people develop lung cancer every year. And unfortunately, at the moment, less than 10% of those will be cured. Now, those survival figures have not improved um, since King George VI, for instance, died of lung cancer in 1952. One of my patients said that the two most frightening words in the English language were lung cancer. And it is a very unpleasant, lethal disease. And it is quite hard knowing that there's not very much you can do to cure them. Well, you have a shadow, but we don't know exactly what it is. Um, we do know that you have got a lump there in the lung. Okay? There's a possibility that it's a cancer. And if it is, then we'll have to decide what to do about it. And then there are one or two other possibilities in large glands and, 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 and so on. You need to have a couple of tests done yet. You need to have what's called uh, a bronchoscopy. We have to look down your throat with a light and a camera and just check out that part of the lung where the shadow is. You also have to have a scan, um, a CAT scan, where we look at the lung in, 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 in centimetre intervals all the way down in minute detail and look at the whole of the lung. And when we've done those two things, we will have a much better idea exactly what is there and then what we should do about it. Hmm? Had you considered the possibility it might be a cancer? No. Not at all? Sure. No, never. Not at all. You have got a lump there in the lung. There's a possibility that it's a cancer. It's a cancer. There has been virtually no basic scientific research into lung cancer in this country. There just hasn't been funding for it, and people have not been tremendously interested in it. The whole emphasis has been put on stopping people smoking. It is true we must stop people smoking, very important, but we must put some resources into understanding how the lung cancer develops. there isn't a research station that looks into lung cancer alone and so that's what I'm trying to get across because the uh, the head lung surgeon of Liverpool Ray Donnelly it's his brainchild and he's so frustrated that he has to tell people like me now at this stage there's nothing else can be done when he knows that with the proper research there is something can be done and uh, a lot of pain and suffering can be taken away from, from our future generations and that's what we're trying to do. Roy's dream was to build a research centre dedicated to lung cancer, a world first for Liverpool. Its aim? To learn how we can spot the disease early enough to treat it. The most important research that we're going to be doing is to identify within the population those individuals who are most at risk of developing lung cancer. And then we have to have a test whereby we can screen those people to detect lung cancer at the very earliest changes. And when we've been able to pick up the earliest changes, we then have to have some treatment for that to stop those changes progressing into full-blown clinical lung cancer. I tell you what, even if I'm not around when the target's reached, there'll be a big sunbeam shining down on the project.
dying of lung cancer is not a pretty sight. He suffered dreadfully and there were times when I thought, you know, if I could, I prayed for him to die because it was so awful to watch him suffer. Um, th there was one night, I mean, he was just choking every 10 seconds and vomiting. I couldn't breathe and he was just in an appalling state. And at one time, I couldn't leave him for, for a minute because of this state that he was in. And at one time, uh, Ray Donnelly phoned and I said, Ray, listen to him. How can he go on like this? What can I do for him? I was desperate. I think it was the lowest point for me. And he, Ray just said to me, well, I can only say, Fiona, it's worse for you than it is for him because on that amount of morphine, although he sounds really bad, he's not experiencing the pain that he sounds as if he's experiencing. So I chose to believe him because that was the only way I could get through it at that time. Since his death, the Roy Castle Cause for Hope Foundation has spectacularly continued raising money for the research center in Liverpool. Following his lead, his widow Fiona has thrown herself into the international spotlight, spreading the warnings about the disease that killed Roy and keeping alight the glimmer of hope that one day the disease may be beaten. After Roy died, I thought there are two alternatives. I can either sit back and do my knitting or just be at home and let the world go by, or I can rise to a challenge. And I decided for as long as I have left to live, I shall rise to the challenge. I made that decision. So I do, for better or worse, and often it's for worse. <laughs> The recent world tour for the foundation took Fiona to Hong Kong, a window on Asia. In China alone, a third of the world's cigarettes are now smoked. An epidemic of two million deaths a year is set to follow. The tour gave Fiona the chance to meet patients and families facing up to the terrible realities of lung cancer. This is Mr. Lok. Hello, Mr. Lok. Uh, uh, this is Mrs. Lok. Hello. 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 And these are their children. Hello. Oh, eldest daughter. Yes. Hello. The second daughter. Hello. 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 Hello.你覺得怎麼樣 he knows that he's going to die soon. My husband also died of lung cancer and he never smoked. Uh, Mrs. Castle said she was like that because her husband has never smoked. But she will have such a disease. 
，因為可能係其他人先嘅。先嘅，我可以。你咁冇咁講。He said that it's because of the fault, the, the smoker's fault, that make your husband suffering from this disease. That's right. Do you find that you people make you feel guilty for having smoked? 你會唔會覺得咧，人哋即係有咗種罪惡感啊？咁樣先應該。應該係。應該政府全力禁止，可以禁百分。He said that the government should ban all smoking, just like banning the heroin and the other drugs. We want, we want the people to see that we are not going to smoke anymore. He said that he sincerely hoped that everybody can can look, take him as an example, and then not to start taking up smoking. How how does it make you feel meeting families that have this disease? I find it very difficult because I just feel their pain for them. Knowing that they have to go through what I went through, um, I cope pretty well. Um, I have a very strong faith and that's helped me. But every time things, the bad things happen to other people, I want to take it on for them because I've gone through it and I know how to cope. And uh, I just see that young family with so many prospects and so many broken dreams so many council plans, it's um, the loss of expectation that they're experiencing right now. His expectation of seeing his children grow up and get married, have jobs, families. Uh, his wife's expectation of a, a happy marriage and retirement, all those things. And as he said, it's self-inflicted. It's something that possibly could have been avoided if he'd known the facts earlier. A month after meeting Wai Shanluk, Fiona was told he had died. He was just 40. This shouldn't happen to you. He said it should not happen to people like you. There's nothing else can be done. There's nothing else can be done. Roy's lung cancer was unexpected, but many smokers, who run much higher risks, still believe it will never happen to them. The tragedy is that it's just all too common. Thanks. Hello. Come sit down. I know. I know. Hello. Come have a seat. How's your throat? It's still a bit sore, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. And how have you been? Terrified. Really, really frightened. We have we have got the results, and um, the biopsies that I took and the washings that I took have shown that this is um, a cancer. Our assessment. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But we're going to do something about it. All right. Um, we're going to have you in, and uh, we're going to do an operation. The. The biopsies that I took and the, the washings and the scans and so on confirmed that that's what it is. And, um, but it looks as if it's operable. And so what we will plan to do is get you in as quickly as we can with a view to a surgery. Now we never know until we're in there the exact extent of what we're dealing with. We can get a good idea from the scans and from the examination that I did um, but it's not until we're actually in there that we will know the full story and that it is definitely operable. All right? At the moment, this looks as if that's what it is and that you need an operation. It's just gossip. It didn't sink in. I thought, I'm going to wake up in a minute. This is a dream and I'm going to wake up. It's not real. I never ever thought this had happened to me, you know what I mean? You think it's happening to other people, I know that's horrible, like, but that's what you think. You don't think it's going to happen to yourself.
The first 24 hours after we'd heard the news, I couldn't look at Roy without bursting into tears. I couldn't talk to him. And uh, I found it was really difficult to actually get my head around anything. Uh, you sort of wander around in a haze and you're almost in denial. You feel it's not really happening. The worst thing was having to tell my youngest son, Benjamin. And uh, I had to sort of break it easy to him what had happened. And it took a while for it to, to really go in for him. And then we all sort of cuddled up together and wept again. And then I had to fold my son in Norway. He's, uh, he's a missionary. And I was really strong. I thought, I'm very strong this time. I'll just tell him. Because he's a big boy. He's 26. And as soon as he, <laughs> he came on the phone. <laughs> Couldn't speak. <laughs> He rang me one afternoon to say that he'd been diagnosed with having cancer and he burst into tears. And I don't know what to say to him. What can you say? And then I put the phone down and then about half an hour later he rang up to apologise for breaking down. He was that kind of bloke. It's just that um, it's like saying goodbye to somebody in a sense. When, when you're not ready. 